Hi everyone, I'm David Chadwick. I'm the founding pastor of Moments of Hope Church. Welcome to Moments of Hope Church Online. We are only online this weekend, Memorial Day weekend, for a lot of different reasons, but we hope you're enjoying your family together, you're worshiping together, and you're experiencing this weekend together to renew your soul and have family time together. Um, we are here to worship the living Lord Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for what Jesus has done in us. We're going to look at a section of Scripture today from John the 7th chapter where Jesus cries out, If anyone is thirsty, let them come to Him, and from their innermost being will flow streams, rivers of living water. Jesus is the answer to the parched souls of our lives. Jesus is the answer for all those wilderness wanderings that seem so insufficient and we don't know how to get home. Jesus is the answer to every life's problem. I want to introduce him anew to you today. But first, let's move to him, our risen Lord, in worship. Dan Anderson and his family are bringing us worship again. Hasn't this been wonderful over the last weeks to see this family, this unified structure of family, bringing us in their gifts and abilities, song and worship. So they're going to do it again today. Let us now worship the living Lord Jesus Christ. Good, Good morning, morning, church. church. Hey, Moms of Hope Church, we are the Anderson family. And if you haven't joined us online in the past couple weeks, we as a family have been on this crazy adventure traveling across the United States in the RV that we're sitting in right now um, and leading worship through all these different locations. We have been all the way to the northern tip of Montana, just south of Canada in freezing cold weather, um, all the way down to Texas in 90 degree weather. We've broken down, we've lost our generator, we've had no heat. We've had no AC. Sayla's about being ready to be done, as you can hear in the RV. But we've had such an incredible journey as a family. And again, we just got the lead worship in these most beautiful places. And so we wanted to share that with you and hopefully that it just moves your heart towards worship and exalting Jesus. So thank you so much. We can't wait to see you guys soon.
Egypt You took me by the hand You marched me out in freedom Into the promised land Now I will not forget you I'll sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever By the fury of your love You stepped into my Egypt by the hand You marched me out into freedom Into the promised land Now I will not forget I'll sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever By the fury of your love Never runs dry Drink of the water 
Hi everyone, thank you again for joining us this Memorial Day weekend online only. We really appreciate your presence and hope you're celebrating Memorial Day in a fantastic, wonderful way. Just a couple of announcements before I bring to you the message that God has laid on my heart from His Word. Uh, first of all, Kids Camp at Hope Farm, uh, June the 22nd from 9 to 4, rising first through third graders, and also June the 24th, uh, 9 to 4 p.m., rising fourth through sixth graders. Go to momentsofhopechurch.org, and you can register there. Great chance for kids to learn God's Word, get to know some other kids, some other hopesters, so we can move down our journey in life together. Um, Hope Teens Crossroad Registration Camp, Clayton King's Camp from June the 28th through July the 2nd is online as well. Great chance for Hope Teens to get to know one another but have a wonderful camp experience where they hear and learn about God's Word. So those are the announcements and before again I bring to you God's Word, I just want to acknowledge a special thanks and celebration to those of you who have served in our armed services, who potentially gave the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom in your service. Thank you so much. And Memorial Day means we remember you. We're thankful for you. We're thankful for those people who are first responders in our nation. And you have allowed this nation to prosper and grow, but especially those of you who have done military service, we remember you well today. We applaud you. We thank God for you. Please know we don't take your service for granted. Now let's move to John the seventh chapter as we continue our study in the Gospel of John. We're going to start with verse 37 through verse 53 today. And if you haven't joined us thus far, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He is at the end of the Feast of the Booths where all the Jews from all over the country would come to Jerusalem for a week uh, at the end of the harvest celebration and have a grand celebration of enormous size and splendor and color and music. Just, just imagine our Memorial Day weekend and its celebration on steroids. That's what it was like. And people, whether rich or poor, would come to Jerusalem and live in tents for seven days. It was to remind them of that time during the wilderness wanderings when they had to live in tents. God's cloud by day and fire by night would lead them. They might be in a tent for three days, then have to pack up and move to another place if the fire or the cloud moved. Um, it might be a month that they stayed in a place, but if the cloud and the fire moved, they had to move as well. And it was a reminder to them of God's faithfulness in the wilderness. As I told you a couple of weeks ago when I preached to you, God does most of His best work in the wilderness when our lives are in the wilderness. And He comes through for us in supernatural ways. We never forget all the ways He came through for us when we think back on those times. Again, in Moments of Hope Church's history, I hope we'll have a time when we celebrate a kind of Feast of the Booths, when we remember how God moved us around from place to place to place to place, and we waited for the promised land He had for us. But He taught us great messages in the testing time about faith, about obedience and about trusting Him in every possible way. So Jesus is at the Feast of the Booths in Jerusalem. It's near the end of the week when we pick up this text. Now, before I read this verse to you, here's what you need to know that happened at the end of the week. The high priest would gather together with all the multiple thousands of people who were gathered there. And this is how they would have their denouement, if you will, the conclusion of all the festivities that had gone on the week before. Uh, the priest would go to the pool of Siloam and he'd take out a huge bucket of water and then he would climb up 15 steps from where the pool of Siloam was to the place in the Temple Mount where everybody could see him. And that was representative, those 15 steps, of Psalm 118 verse 15. And then when the high priest would get to the top of the 15th step, he would stop and everybody knew what they were supposed to do. He would pour out the water as a sign and a symbol, a remembrance, if you will, of how God, for example, in the wilderness, when the people were thirsty, he brought them water out of a rock. It was an amazing miracle that God accomplished. And so when the priest poured out that water down the steps, people would remember God's supply of living water in the wilderness when they were dry and thirsty. God is able to provide anything and everything we may need when we need it. Now, right after he would pour out the water, 
there would be a pause of several seconds. And then traditionally what would happen is the people would break into a song of praise of Psalm 118, verse 15. And there was actually a song put into music about this verse some years ago. It went something like this, And shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. Now, if you remember, the Israelites lived for those 40 years in tents. And that Psalm 118 verse 15 was a way of shouting for joy, remembering all the victorious moments that God brought to His people when they were living in the tents of the righteous of the Lord. But this year, when Jesus was present, something extraordinary happened before they went into that song. The high priest poured out the water, waited for a few seconds before the people burst into that praise of song. But before they started singing, look what happens in John 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out with a loud voice, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Catch the scenario? High priest pours out the water. There's silence. People get ready to burst into the praise. And shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents. But before they start singing, Jesus stands up and cries out this whole idea of if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. That scripture is from Isaiah 55, 1, where Isaiah cries out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to God. That's what Jesus was quoting here. So can you imagine the people getting ready to sing this loud chorus of praise before they get the chance? Jesus stands up and shouts out these words as the priest pours out this living water in celebration of the end of the Feast of the Booths. What's he saying? He's basically saying that for all of you out there, whether you're in your wilderness or not, as God supplied that living water through the rock, God can supply living water to your parched souls. And the way that water can be supplied, Jesus said, is through me, that I am that living water who will give life to your parched souls in your wandering wildernesses if anyone thirsts. Don't we all thirst? You know, it was Pascal, the famous mathematician and philosopher, who said, God has created within all of us a God-shaped void. We all thirst. We thirst for truth. We thirst for security. We thirst for presence. We thirst for life and meaning. And that's what Jesus is saying here. I anyone who's thirsty right now, and that basically means everybody. Jesus' invitation is for the world. He wants anyone and everyone to come to Him and believe in Him. The invitation again, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. You see, the Christian faith, dear friends, is not rules and regulations. They bring death. Later on in the scripture, it says the law brings death. Why does it bring death? Because it shows how sinful we are and how hopeless we are. The law is God's righteous standard, and trying to keep it is absolutely impossible. In fact, there's a rebellion against the law. The illustration I've often used is when you're walking down the street and you see a sign that says, no trespassing, don't walk on the grass. What does your foot just want to do? It, it just starts like a magnet moving toward the grass to walk on it. There's something within us that wants to rebel against the law, the moral law of God, the purity and holiness of the moral law of God shows how each one of us is a sinner. The only thing that gives life and hope and meaning and gives water to thirsty souls is a personal relationship with Jesus. That's what the Christian faith is. Dear friends, it is not 
merely following rules and regulations. It is following a person named Jesus. And when he enters your heart, he touches the deepest longings of who you are inside your soul. And he pours out his living water on our parched hearts. And they start to have life, blessing, and blooming like never before. That's what Jesus is saying here. Then he says in verse 38, whoever believes in me. Notice that Jesus' offer of his eternal love and forgiveness is for anyone and everyone. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, Isaiah 55, 1, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Several things I want to point out here. Out of his heart. Uh, that Greek word could be literally translated bowels, intestines, innermost being. Uh, in the feminine form, it could be translated womb. In, in the, the deepest parts of who you are, we, we tend to think our heart is just here, but biblically the heart's always symbolic of the deepest part of who you are. Uh, Proverbs 4.23, uh, out of the heart is the wellspring of all life. And Jesus here says that whoever believes in him, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, out of the deepest parts of who you are, out of the core of your being, out of your sense of identity. There's so much in our culture right now, folks, that is wrong because people have misunderstood identity. People have found their identity in their victimhood, in what's happened to them. And from Jesus' perspective, your identity is not in what's happened to you. Your identity is found in what Jesus has done for you. It's in Him and Him alone. That's the way we'll solve all of the divisions in our culture. If everyone would come to understand who Jesus is and our identity is found solely and completely in Him. He says if anyone comes to Him and drinks, out of his heart will flow. Flow. Out of your innermost being will flow. The word there implies a torrent. Uh, think in terms of a raging river. Uh, think in terms of how a river gets started. It is ice and snow on top of a mountain that then is melted and then comes down into the river and causes a torrential flow of that river. Think in terms of Jesus, death on the cross, resurrection, ascension to heaven. He's on the mountaintop looking at us and our every need, and He then through the power of his life, lets the Holy Spirit be unleashed from him, down from heaven, down the mountainside, in a torrential love torrent into our hearts. That, that's what he's saying is promised to whoever believes in him. And notice it's rivers, plural. Notice some of the greatest cities in America, like New York City and Pittsburgh and others, are built on a place where two mighty rivers come together. Notice that most every great city is built by a mighty river. That's because water is essential for life. So out of your innermost being will have a torrent of living waters, plural. All kinds of flowing from heaven into your innermost being. All kinds of love, grace, mercy, kindness, compassion. All the things God wants to give to you. Forgiveness, His eternal presence. All those things flow into your deepest innermost being and then out of that flows your life flows who you are flows your purpose in life that's what jesus promises us living waters not a cesspool where mosquitoes and other kinds of things cause all kinds of diseases but living waters waters that move waters that have life that's what he promised to each one of you now again get that scenario the, the people are getting ready to sing psalm 118 15 and jesus burst into this Believe in me, and whoever wants to come to me and believe in me, I'll give in your innermost being floods, torrents of living waters, plural. What a promise. And in John, as he's writing this gospel some years after Jesus' life, death, and ascension into heaven, gives us a commentary of what Jesus meant. In verse 39, he says, Now this he, Jesus, said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So John comments here that who Jesus was talking about, and notice I said who because the Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. He is the third person of the Godhead. He's the silent sovereign. 
He's not often talked about in the scripture, but when he does get noticed, he's pointing people to Jesus. We see him in Genesis 1 when he is brooding over all creation. He is the creative power of God. He's also the new creation power of God in our lives when he takes our stony, hardened hearts and does a complete radical heart transplant and the very spirit of the living God, the third person of the Godhead, comes and indwells us. John said that's whom Jesus is talking about, the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, but he could not yet be given to the disciples to live inwardly. This living water poured out inwardly until he'd been glorified. Now, what's the glorified idea? Throughout John, whenever Jesus is referred as being glorified, that's the cross. That's the cross. Jesus had to pay in a substitutionary atonement the price for our sins. Jesus went to the cross and took all of our penalty of sin upon himself so we wouldn't have to have it. And then as we receive him as our Lord and Savior, our hearts are cleansed. And now the Holy Spirit can have access to a holy heart that's been wholly forgiven. And Jesus comes and indwells in the third person of the Godhead. And folks, when he does, the Holy Spirit, again, not an it, but a person, takes control of our entire lives. You see, the issue with the Holy Spirit for so many Christians, in my opinion, is not whether you have the Holy Spirit in you when you receive Jesus. You do. The question is, how much of the Holy Spirit has of you? Does He have just a little bit of you? A kind of bit of you? The Holy Spirit wants all of you. And when He takes all of you over out of your innermost beings, out of your gut, out of who you are deep inside, He touches you. He fills you. He controls you. He overwhelms you. He baptizes you. And out of that flows the very life of Jesus to the world. That's the promise that Jesus gave us. That's what John said comes when we receive Jesus and the third person of the Godhead. Now, the people see this happening when they heard these words, verse 40. Remember, they're getting ready to sing, And shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. Of the... They're getting ready to sing Psalm 118, 15. Jesus interrupts with this cry when they heard him say these words. Some of the people said, this really is the prophet. So now you're seeing how people responded to Jesus when he did this and out of the other things he'd done from John 1 through where we are right now. Um, some said he's the prophet. Now, who's that? In Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 18, Moses said there would come one after him who would be the prophet. And a lot of people believed that maybe that was going to be Elijah come back or just another mighty man of God who would precede the coming of the Messiah. So some people in hearing Jesus said this go, hmm, he must be the prophet that Moses was talking about in Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18. But you know, in the Bible, it's very clear that in the book of Acts and other places, different writers and different people speaking in the different texts in the Bible referred to Jesus as that prophet. Very clearly, the Bible says Jesus is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18. But at this point, some people go, oh, this, this, this must be the prophet. They haven't committed themselves to Jesus yet. They just say, this, this must be the prophet. Second group said, others said, this is the Christ. Some people came to understand he's the Christ. Now, remember, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. Christ is a title. It means the anointed one, the chosen one. It was the expectation of the Messiah, the one that God would choose to enter the world and eradicate Roman evil and allow Israel to t return to its glory days. And so there were those who said, he, he must be the Christ. I mean, first of all, who would interrupt the celebration of the high priest and our singing except the Christ? And then they probably also would remember some of Jesus' miracles, like turning water into wine and healing a man who'd been lame for 38 years, uh, the Roman official's son whom he healed from a distance. They probably knew these stories or heard about these stories. They also remembered some of Jesus' own claims where he said things like, you know, I am the bread of life that whoever eats of me will never hunger again. He made claims like the Father and I are one. He made claims like through me you'll have eternal life. Uh, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I mean, all those extraordinary claims found a lot in John 5, 6, and 7. People heard those claims. They saw his miracles. So some number concluded that he's the Christ. 
Again, there was a first group that were kind of spiritual seekers. Oh, he must be the prophet. Another group said, no, he is the anointed one of God. He's the long-awaited Messiah. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there were others who were kind of spiritual skeptics, if you will, trying to figure it all out. And they go, isn't the Messiah supposed to come from David's lineage? And isn't he supposed to be born in Bethlehem? And it just shows how many spiritual skeptics, even today, who are kind of seeking for Jesus, just don't know the facts. And if they would study the facts, for example, about the resurrection, study the facts about the prophecies that were written six to seven hundred years ago being fulfilled in Jesus in specificity and the probability factor being one to like the 10,000th factor of that possibly occurring. If they just do the study, they would come to faith in him. And here are these people saying, well, well, isn't the Messiah from the lineage of David and from to be born in the town of Bethlehem? And little did they know that Micah 5, 2 did prophesy that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Guess where Jesus was born? Bethlehem. They just didn't know it. Uh, if you trace the lineage of Jesus through Mary and Joseph, you'll see that through both lines, he's traced back to King David. So both of the questions that were asked here about Jesus were answerable in veracity to who Jesus claimed to be. They just didn't know the facts, how many people today are going to spend a Christless eternity because they're just spiritual skeptics a asking all the questions but not willing to find the answers. Verse 43, so there was a division among the people over him. You need to know that Jesus causes a division. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 and onward, Jesus said, don't think that I came to bring unity. I came to bring a sword. And I will divide mothers and fathers and children and mothers and children and fathers and cousins and aunts. I came to divide. And folks, that is so true. We see it in our nation somewhat. Some of you come from homes where you've come to faith in Jesus and your family's rejected you. They just don't want any part of you. They feel like you've gone off the deep end. Uh, in other nations in the world, when people come to faith in Jesus, especially in Islamic nations, some in Hindu nations as well, you are eliminated from the family. You're kicked out. You're written out of the will. You have no inheritance whatsoever. Jesus said that he would cause division, and here we have another example of that where some were kind of spiritual seekers and looking, others were firmly committed to him, yet others were spiritual skeptics. Division was caused among the people. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. You know, there was another group that were just very angry with him, a fourth group of div division that occurred. A group really hated him. They wanted him dead. We saw at the beginning of John 7 that there were the religious leaders, the capital J Jews, the officials who had already begun a plot to kill Jesus. They'd already manufactured a list of false charges against him to bring to Rome in order to have him killed. They were jealous. They were envious of him. They didn't like his position of power. They didn't like all the multitudes who followed him, all those who really were excited about him. They wanted him gone. But they didn't arrest him yet. Why? Well, the people liked him too much. And also, this is even more important, we saw this two weeks ago, Jesus said, for my time has not yet come. There was a perfect time that God the Father had ordained for Jesus to go to the cross. It's going to come in another month, but it had not come yet. So they could not lay a hand on him because the time was not right. Then we see in verse 45, the officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? So we saw in John's message last week how officers were conscripted by the religious leaders and they said to the officers, go and arrest him right now. Well, they come back without having arrested him. The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. So here's another group of people who are just amazed at Jesus. You can say what you want to about Jesus, dear friends, but there's no human being. No person who's ever lived, who's ever touched this world and changed this world the way Jesus has. And when you read his teachings in his word, you're amazed at what he teaches. You're amazed at the insights and truth that he gives. You're amazed to see that if we just would follow the way that he taught, our world would be such a better place in which to live. And so the officers heard Jesus teach and they backed off. 
And they said, we, we can't arrest him. We've never heard anybody teach like this guy. Well, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the capital J Jews who were plotting to have Jesus killed, have you also been deceived? I mean, they start mocking the Roman officers. Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? I mean, they're looking at their own elitist position in the society. I mean, there are none of us, Pharisees and others of high-ranking position in our society and culture, who would dare believe in Jesus. That's another reason a lot of people don't believe in Jesus. They're so arrogant and so prideful, they can't believe that a Galilean carpenter who lived 2,000 years ago is my ticket to heaven, is my means of spending eternal life with God. How ridiculous. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And they think they're intellectually above the whole understanding of the gospel. And that's why Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, has a verse where he said, Not many among you are wise and understanding. Dear friends, the gospel spreads most powerfully and significantly among the middle class and the poor. The people who have not necessarily had all the education that puffs up their brain and makes them think they're so knowledgeable they don't need the gospel. Here, the Pharisees place themselves in that elitist position. And then we continue. Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. <laughs> there it is again, looking down in pride on the masses, on the people who have not been educated. They don't know the law like we know the law. They're not educated like we know the law. And he, then the Pharisees call the crowd accursed. D do you see the spiritual pride? They're basically saying that we've got all the knowledge. We're going to go to heaven. God loves us, but those people down there who are following Jesus, they're accursed. That word means they can go to hell. They can just go to hell. They wrote them off because they weren't of the same quality in education as they were. Now verse 50, Nicodemus, remember him? In John the third chapter, he came to Jesus by night. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, one of the 70 most powerful Jews in all of Jerusalem. Nicodemus had this encounter where Jesus said, you must be born again. Uh, he is there seen a little bit later asking questions about John the Baptist and his baptism and seeing Jesus baptizing a bunch of other people. Um, we don't know whether he'd come to a deep and abiding faith in Jesus yet. It doesn't seem so. He is very timid when he answers some of the Pharisees' questions. Nicodemus, who had gone to him, Jesus, before, that's John 3, and who was one of them, one of the Sanhedrin, one of the capital J Jews, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? So here's what Nicodemus is doing. Doesn't our law guarantee due process? But before we judge someone and kill him, should we not bring him before us and allow him to answer the charges that we're bringing against him? I mean, any common decency says that if you're going to accuse a person, especially with the potential of death, you would allow that person to come and appear before you in due process and defend the accusations that are being made against you. That's what Nicodemus is sim simply saying here. Should not we who are educated and try to live by the law grant due process and grant this Jesus a chance to defend himself? It's kind of a tepid quasi-defense of Jesus. You can't really tell if he's really committed himself to Jesus or he's still afraid of his other Pharisees and he, he might have to face the same death that Jesus would face. You're not sure, but at least he takes some kind of step in defense of Jesus. Look at verse 52. They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Now, this is very interesting on several different fronts. One being that they are putting aside one of their own because he's not responding the way they want him to respond. So they're, they're seeing division even in their own group. But also when they ask the question, isn't it true that uh, a Galilean has no prophet arise from there? And then also the question of, are you from Galilee? Well, they are saying to Nicodemus, an ultimate put down. Because in that day, folks, racism is not new. Bigotry and prejudice is not new. And in that day, the Pharisees who were well-educated and lived in Judea in the southern part of Israel had an arrogance and pride against anybody from the north Galilee. They thought they were more educated. They thought they were better than. So they look at Nicodemus and say, are you from Galilee too? And the truth is, no prophet has ever come out of Galilee, which just isn't true. If you look at the Bible, you see that Elijah 
came from Galilee, that Nahum, the prophet in the Old Testament, came from Galilee. Uh, you see also that Jonah came from Galilee. So it's just not true to say that no prophet ever came from Galilee. It just shows how arrogant elitists can be. They think they have all the answers and they don't know everything. The same is true in our culture today. When you have cultural elitists who think they know everything and they should be able to tell us how to live our lives, they think they know everything, but the reality is they don't know everything. And really those of us who know Jesus and have his wisdom in our hearts, we know a whole lot more than they'll ever hope to know. So then we see at the beginning of chapter 8 uh, of 53 and also a 1 because in the text of the earliest manuscripts these two things kind of came together. But it says, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So after this encounter and after the divisions are seen, the people went home and Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And it looks like he spent the night there and we'll pick up next week what happens next. But here's the point, dear friends. You've heard a message about who Jesus is. He's God in human flesh. He came to save us from our sins. He wants to have a personal living relationship with you. Will you invite him into your heart? If you do, out of your innermost being will flow torrents of living, not stagnant, but living waters, plural, rivers of water, plural, and they will refresh your soul. They'll give you life like you've never known it before. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Jesus still causes divisions today. There are some who are curious. Uh, there are others who truly believe He's the Christ. Uh, there are others who are spiritually skeptical and try to find excuses not to believe. There are others who are just flat antagonistic to Him. Which one's you? Which one's you? Now, if you just go home and disregard this message and don't do anything with it, uh, you haven't chosen to do anything with your life of meaning. You, you have rejected the king of the universe. I pray that you'll go home hearing this message, but you'll come back a different person. And you will have given your life radically to the risen Lord. And when you do, you'll have the strength that you need to face any problem. You won't need people or any other person to meet the deepest longings of your heart. Jesus will do so inside of you. I beg you, I implore you, please give your life to Jesus and then drink of Him. And when you do, you'll never thirst again. He'll satiate the deepest longings of your heart. He will satisfy your soul. That's who my Jesus is, a personal relationship I have with Him. I beg you to have that with Him as well. To Him alone and always belongs all the glory. Amen and amen. Father in heaven, for all those who are viewing this right now, I pray if there's anyone out there who feels dry in the wilderness, I pray they would yield to you, invite you into their hearts, into their innermost being, and I pray, Lord, that you would refresh their souls. Lord, there's a wonderful old song, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, O God, taken from Psalm 42. Lord, I pray that we would be like the deer who's panting thirstily for water and we would drink of you the living water of the universe. Lord, I pray if there's anyone who has not given their lives to Jesus, they would do so now. Lord, if even one person online right now gives their life to Jesus, all the hours of preparation that I put into this message and others have in filming it, it makes sense. It's purposeful. Please yield your heart to the Lord. Give your life to Him and cry out on that last day, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Son of the living God and you will be saved. You'll have living water. You'll never thirst again. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for supporting Moments of Hope Church. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, if you'd like to give to our church, go to the giving tab in your right-hand corner. You can give online there. Or if you want to write a check and send that to us, please do so at Moments of Hope Church, uh, 4500 Cameron Valley Parkway, Suite 400, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28211. Please stay tuned for... Uh, announcements we may have about our next place where the cloud is moving us. We'll let you know as soon as we know. We're just so thankful for your financial support that allows us to be generous, to give to different people and organizations locally and globally, to be faithful in what God wants us to do with that money through your generosity. So thank you so much. May Jesus alone and always belongs the glory. Now may we worship again the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Thirsty, are you empty? Come and drink these.
Thank you all for worshiping with us today at Moments of Hope Church Online. Again, happy Memorial Day weekend. Thank you for those of you who have given your service to our great nation. We appreciate you so much. And remember that our call from Jesus is to become a great disciple of His. Well, what's a disciple? We believe three words define discipleship. Those who know Jesus intimately, personally. We know Him so much that out of our innermost being flow streams of living water, rivers of living water, living water, not stagnant water. He is our life. So know Him personally, intimately. The Christian faith has rules and regulations, but we follow them because we want to, not because we have to. We are in such a union life with our Lord. We want to do whatever He calls us to do. We are following Him. But also grow in Him. Continue to learn about Him in every area of theology, doctrine, Bible. Continue to grow in Him. But ultimately, just go. Go give your life away. Go find a way that you can go serve the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do so, you're never more like Him. No, grow, go. That's what defines a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. We hope and pray that will define all members and disciples of Moments of Hope Church. We'll give you more information about membership as that becomes clearer to us. We'll have another class very soon. Thank you for joining us online. We appreciate you so much. God bless you, and I'll talk with you all next week at Hope Farm on June the 6th.